Now on to our top story. Hundreds of people wrongly convicted in the Horizon scandal are to be exonerated under laws set to come into effect by the end of July, with the government saying the possible exoneration of some guilty people is a price worth paying. But in a newly published letter sent last month, the Post Office Chief Executive Nick Reid told the Justice Secretary it stands by the 369 convictions of Post Office operators and would oppose attempts to overturn them. Joining us now to discuss this is our political correspondent, Alicia Fitzgerald, and Conservative Chair of the London Assembly, Andrew Boff. Um, Alicia, first to you. This decision announced yesterday by Kevin Hollenrake that the convictions would be quashed. And now this letter revealed from the post office saying actually they're standing by more than half of the convictions that were brought by the post office. Definitely. I mean, that letter that we saw from Nick Reed was one that's got a lot of attention mm. because people found it quite bizarre. I mean, initially there was the, uh, the thought that there was around 700 uh, people involved in this scandal, and this, this letter is leading to around 360 of them. So there's a bit of confusion there about, about what Nick Reed was really trying to get at. And he's basically saying that there is some concern that by exonerating everyone who was involved in the scandal, that then there would be some people who kind of slipped through the cracks mm. there. But Andrew, just in terms of this, I mean, people's lives have been devastated by what has gone on. We know there were over 900 prosecutions brought. Isn't the government actually right to do what it's doing, which is to move this and say, actually, we're going to quash all of those convictions? And sure, if there are some guilty people who get away with it, that's the price and it's worth paying. I, I, it's right that action has to be taken. Those people deserve justice. And I think any conviction that was um, used horizon data as a basis should be quashed. Um, I'm just a little concerned at the way in which it's being done. The way that politicians in, in the House of Commons would be able to rule whether or not somebody is guilty or innocent. So you're concerned about I the precedent of this I'm really sense. worried about the precedent. The government is saying that, you know, it wouldn't have established a precedent. Mm. I can't see how, once you've done it, that's so, your precedent. So why is the government doing it? Is this because it's actually electorally really important for this government? I think it's because it's a quick and easy way of getting it done. The, real, the way it should be done under, under the conventions that this country has established over hundreds of years is that each of those cases needs, need to be quashed. Now, if they need to put more resources into speeding up that process, that's it. I'm just worried about ruling it, it, uh, politicians saying whether or not somebody's innocent or guilty. But they've really had years concerned. to be tackling this, haven't they? This you know, a the, quick and easy process now, but only after the public outcry following that ITV dramatisation. Definitely. And I think the issue with this and why this decision has taken a while and just over the past few months to, to come to to exonerate everyone in one kind of blanket way, if that makes sense, is because the issue was that having individuals take their cases uh, into legal action and go through that process would be so, so timely and also pretty traumatic for lots of the victims. Lots of victims have come forward and said that the thought of having to go through like individual personal legal action and appeal their cases and kind of live up all of that that drama again mm. for them would have been really traumatic. So I think the government's argument here is that by doing this, it's kind of the least traumatic You've got way to take for the exception. Well, action, and actually, Kevin Hollingray, the yeah. post office minister, said legislation would immediately quash the convictions of hundreds of post office operators in England as well. It, it's a very muddy picture, though. If you've got the post office still standing by some of the convictions that they brought, you've got the government saying another thing. And as you mentioned earlier, this is about precedent. It really is about precedent. I mean, we've had in our recent history examples of, for example, people who were thrown out of the military for being gay. Mm. Um, and we, we, we know that to be unjust. What you can't do is just pass a law to, to, to resolve that. You have to approach each individual case, no matter how painful that is, because to go back on that precedent... We've seen what's happened in the House of Commons. Only yesterday, when you abandon precedent, when you abandon the rules and you abandon the conventions, and the chaos that that can produce. So I think the government needs to tre tread very mm. carefully yeah. with this. I'm not saying it's entirely wrong, but they do need to tread carefully. Let's talk about that chaos in the Commons and the ongoing fallout. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, so Lindsay Hoyle, he survived the day yesterday. Can he cling on now? Do you think the heat has started to to come out of this. Definitely. I thought it was really interesting, that kind of timeline that we saw from the moment that all of that 
drama, for lack of a better term, unfolded um, over yesterday because we saw this early day motion that was tabled by Will Ragg. He's a Conservative MP and he was basically saying that he no longer has confidence in the Speaker, in, in his role anymore. Signatures mounting on this, loads of MPs coming forward and saying that they agree. But then in the same breath almost, lots of MPs also coming forward and saying that Lindsay Hoyle is a really honourable speaker. They really like him. They think that his track record is really good. So kind of coming to his defence mm. as well. I, I thought you explained it so well on Wednesday. You were in uh, Central Lobby, weren't you, at that time, and trying to make sense of what was going on and trying to explain to people what on earth this opposite, Opposition Day motion meant, why he had broken with precedent mm -hmm. and where we are from here. But just in terms of that, I thought what was interesting, I think it was yesterday, Penny Morden mm. very much changing the tone, throwing it back to Labour. How much do we know? Starmer said he did not pressure Hoyle, but he did say we had a meeting to ensure there was the widest possible a group of voices that were heard. Those two things to me certainly aroused suspicions. It's interesting because on the day of the debate, there was a big kind of rumour and accusation that Keir Starmer had threatened Lindsay Hoyle into actually discussing the Labour amendment in the debate, which obviously was a huge accusation mm. to make and would have been really, really quite serious if that if that turns out to be true. Keir Starmer since then has said he categorically denies ever threatening Lindsay Hoyle, but admits to saying that he urged Lindsay Hoyle to have a really open and broad debate. So, I mean, you can take from that what you will. Lots of people saying that him urging him to do that just implies that he's asking him to, to table Labour's amendment. Lots of people saying that that's a bit of a reach. So we'll have to wait and see over the next... And those Penny Mordaunt remarks uh, yesterday, um, helpful to uh, Sir Lindsay Hoyle because the government's certainly not calling for him uh, to go. But remarkable, she said, I would never have done to him mm. what the Labour Party has done well, to him. I mean, yeah. she was accusing Labour of putting themselves before the country as, and indeed the interests of the people in Israel and Gaza. As usual, Penny uh, hits the nail on the head. Um, and the problem here is the pressure that was put on uh, the, the speaker and unfortunately what the speaker's now lost is um, his appearance of impartiality and the confidence of the house you know in a very small way I kind of empathize with them I chair the London Assembly I'm quite clearly a conservative uh, politician but when I chair the Assembly I have to make sure that all members feel as though I'm speaking for them and working on their behalf if you lose that then you lose th that um, ability to be able to uh, to allow people to debate in, a, in an environment that they feel is fair yeah, to them. Can, can, and that's what we've now well, got in Parliament, which is a real position, shame. From your position, can you have sympathy with the Speaker here? Because clearly, we're coming up to an election. Labour is way ahead in terms of the polling at 46% or thereabouts, according to the latest poll. Now, Starmer, had that Opposition Day motion gone the other way, he could have been in serious trouble. So... Actually, do you have sympathy with Hoyle? Because obviously Starmer did have a conversation, which is what Alicia said. I, I, I think what I alluded to earlier, when you abandon those conventions at your peril, they are, they're there for good reasons, and those conventions have been established over, in, in the case of the House of Commons, over hundreds of years. And, and you, if you abandon that because you see a temporary problem that you want to fix, and you feel it's better to do it, you know, get it out of the way. This is the kind of thing that happens. And, and I'm afraid, you know, I don't call for people to resign. It's very easy to call for people to resign, but it must be a very difficult position for him to be in at the moment. And I, if I were in his position, I, I, I would consider re uh, resigning. Well, as in Lindsay Hoyle? Yeah. Do you think it's likely? No. Not at all. No, I mean, his no, temporary no. problem that he was trying to solve, as, as Andrew describes it, I mean, he was saying it's all about the safety mm. of MPs and this very, very toxic atmosphere. Definitely. I think this the, the most important thing, do you know what, even aside from Lindsay Hoyle as, as a person, you know, obviously this is an issue, but I think this just opens a broader debate about whether mm. or not parliamentary democracy is yeah. being challenged by external factors. Like, if that is the case, so, mm. so if... If this is true, that what caused Lindsay Hoyle to make that decision was genuinely because people outside of Parliament were threatening MPs Which so was much. Rishi we... Sunak's point. That yeah, then, then, then mm. that is a serious issue. Uh, and we'll talk about that later, here. of course. We saw those uh, images being projected onto uh, Big Ben as well, which a lot of people have taken issue with. But also, just in terms of this, 
I think for people sitting at home in the cost of living crisis, worried about how they're going to pay for their heating or their gas or putting food on the table, here you've got politicians who are dance, dancing around semantics over whether it's a humanitarian pause, a ceasefire, an immediate a ceasefire. That is doesn't seem relevant to people in this country. And in the weeds of those procedural... Yeah. Arcanities, I suppose, making that word up. But, you know, it, it was pretty unedifying, <laughs> wasn't it? Um, uh, Alicia, Andrew, thank you both uh, very much indeed. Let